Good afternoon. Isn't it amazing? I was thinking about the fact that less than 48 hours ago I was in an operating room and, uh, and then, then I'm here today with the strength to preach. I was just thanking God for His mercy in that. The Lord is good. <clears throat> there is nothing too hard for Him. And you know what? I would rather be reminded that my strength is not in me. My strength is in the Lord. Um, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but it says the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen. Right? And so regardless of what we go through, our testimony is the Lord is able. Don't look at me. I don't have the ability. I'm just an empty vessel. Right? The excellency of the power is of God, not of us. Without Him, we are nothing. Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter number 12. <clears throat> Luke 12, and I want to talk about, again, re being ready for Christ's return. We looked at this last Lord's Day. <clears throat> and um, well, let's just read, let's begin reading in verse number thirty-five to kind of refresh our minds and what we considered last time, and refresh ourselves in the topic. Luke twelve and verse number thirty-five says, "Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning." We focused on let your loins be girded about last week. It says, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Let's pray again. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to gather together with thy saints. Lord, what an encouragement it has been to my heart to be able to be among the people of God this day. Lord, thank you for the refreshing, uh, the washing of water by thy word. Lord, thank you for that sincere milk of the word of God that we desire as, as these babes in Christ. Lord, we need you. We need you to feed us. Uh, we understand that you are the bread of life and you are that you are the one that sustains us. You are our everything, God. We are nothing without you. We'd have no hope. We can do nothing without you. Lord, we confess that freely. And so we, we come before you now asking you for your mercy, asking that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to consider these things aright, that you would, Lord, you would keep us from error, that you would give us clarity of mind and speech, and that you would manifest yourself by your spirit. Lord, that you would speak to every heart that is here. God, teach us and instruct us that we might leave this place, uh, Lord, knowing you better, that we might leave this place, God, under, uh, getting some clarity and understanding things better in our lives, that we might see how we, we should serve you and how we should honor you in this present age. God, grant us that wisdom. You said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that you give liberally and you upbraideth not. So we ask you for that wisdom now to faithfully declare the word of God at this hour. Thank you for all that has gone before. We pray for your mercies upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So last time we looked at let your loins be girded. We considered, the one thing we know about the Lord's return is that we don't know when it is, right? It comes at an hour like it warns us here in our text that, it, that when, when men think not. And so we better be prepared. And we desire that. We, we, we desire to be ready for the Lord's return. We want to have a consciousness that it is the Lord's soon return. We always want to be aware of the fact that at any moment our Master may be here. And He is here now in presence with us. And so we want to live with that awareness even now, right? So that when He does visibly appear and all men see Him and finally He gets that glory that He deserves where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, we want to be those servants that are ready at their Lord's return. And so last week we saw the description of these individuals that were ready, those servants that were prepared for His return. And the first description that we saw of them is that their loins were girded about. And if you remember, just to, just to kind of quickly sort of run through some of those things, their loins being girded, that's, that's an outward thing, right? It's, if someone's got their loins girded about uh, during that time, it was clear that they, had, they were dressed in that fashion, right? They had their, you know, and they, they wore the, the men wore skirts then too, right? Um, and, 
and so and so they would pull those things up, basically turn them into pants. They'd tuck it down in their, their belt, and so they were ready for travel, and they were ready for action, right? They were able to do things that may have been restricted if they were just in those robes. And so uh, that's what it means to have your loins girded about. And so we looked at some passages that had to do with that, and we saw that in essence uh, it, uh, it was associated with being ready, a spirit of readiness, right? They were ready in mind. It showed maturity. Uh, uh, God said, grow up, be a man to Job, gird yourself like a man. Uh, so they were ready in mind. They were ready to leave just like the Israelites were told to be ready when they ate the Passover land, right? Considering Egypt wasn't going to be their home. So ready to leave that place. And uh, uh, as we are strangers and pilgrims in this life, we saw it was also associated with being ready to journey uh, as commanded, as sent by God. Um, we considered that with being girded about. And then finally also ready to run. Those that run the race, uh, they're uh, the ones that would run, they would gird themselves, uh, uh, the, gird their loins about them to be prepared for uh, running, and then also they were ready to fight. The men of war uh, were girded about. So those were all things that we associated with those that were ready for the master's return because their loins were gird about. But then what we want to look out at today is they also, in verse 35 in our text, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. So what do we understand from that spiritually as we are prepared and made ready for the Lord's return? And by the way, I couldn't help but rejoice in what Brother Gene, the very last verse that Brother Gene read this morning was in 1 Peter 2. And I just want to read this again because you're going to see how well it goes with our thoughts this afternoon. It says... Um, um, it was 1 Peter 2. Right? Oh, there it is, verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now, what is it that these servants have in their preparedness and in their readiness? They have light, right? Their lamps are burning, their lights are are burning. This word uh, lights here is, is sometimes translated candle in other places. Uh, some translations read lamps here. And so that's what we were talking about. We, they've got these candles, these lamps that are lit and burning as they're awaiting the Lord's return. And so we saw that last time, which manifested itself outwardly in the girding of their loins. And we, and we saw all that that was associated with in their readiness. Now we're again considering something that's manifested outwardly, outwardly right? Light, if Someone's got a candle lit. You see that outwardly. But we're going to understand this afternoon how this is specifically tied to their activity. How are we to be made ready for our Lord's return in our activity? Activity. How are we prepared in that fashion? And so before we kind of dive into what that activity is, let's refresh ourselves concerning light. Okay, one thing that we see is that they have light. And you know what? You've got to have light to do a job well, right? Would you agree with that? It's hard to work in the dark, isn't it, right? When you can't see, it's hard to do anything like it ought to be done. You ever clean something when the lighting's not very good and then when the sun comes up the next morning, you look at it and you're like, man, I missed the light, right? Because there's not enough light to see. You can't do a job well if you don't have light. I want, look at the experience of the wicked in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter number 4. Man, thank God it was my left hand and not my right hand, you know? Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs 4 and verse number 19. The way of the wicked is as what? Darkness. darkness. That's their experience. It's as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. That's the danger when you're in the dark, right? You, you stumble over things. You can't see uh, to do things well. You can't be ready. You can't be working well for the master in this state. This is the state of the wicked. But the servants in our text aren't like that. Their dwelling is in a state of light, light that's ever burning. And so they are ever prepared to do well the tasks that they've been girded about to perform. That's what we saw with, the, with them being girded about. They were prepared for, for whatever the Lord required of them, right? They're ready to work. They're ready to labor. And so they also have the light so that they may able, be able to see well to, uh, to attend to the task that God commands them to do. Look at, uh, well, you know what? We don't even need to go there. What's the first distinction that we find in Scripture? What's the very first thing that God does? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And it was out without form and it was void. And what was upon the face of the deep? Darkness. 
was upon the face of the deep. And what did the Lord say? Let there be light. And our brothers faithfully told us that's nothing more than the revelation of Jesus Christ at the very because sun, moon, and stars aren't coming until day four, right? But the very beginning, the true light of the world is revealed. It's the first thing that's revealed. So the first thing that God does at the very beginning of Scripture is He makes a distinction between the light and the darkness. And He saw the light and He said He saw it and said that it was good. Notice He didn't say that about the darkness, did He? The light was good in the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first distinction that we have in Scripture is that of light from darkness. And you know what? The two never mix. I mean, by definition, they don't go together, right? When you turn the light on, what are you doing? You're dispelling the darkness. They are distinct from one another. One is preferred and the other is rejected. Look at Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2. What time do we start? Okay. Ecclesiastes 2. Listen to this in verse number 13. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly. Those two are distinct from one another, right? Wisdom and foolishness don't go together. He's going to make a couple other distinctions here as well. And he says in the first part of the verse that wisdom is above folly. Wisdom is what ought to be desired rather than folly. And he says it's just like the same distinction as far as what? Light, Light excelleth darkness. One is preferred of the other, over the other. Light is preferred over darkness. One to be preferred and the other rejected, just like wisdom is to be preferred and folly rejected. And so these ready men that we find in our text in Luke 12, right, they, are, they make that distinction. They prefer light over darkness. Their lamps are burning. They clearly distinguish between the two. They're not like these. Look at Isaiah 5. L listen to these individuals here in Isaiah 5. They don't, make, they don't know how to make the distinction between the light and the darkness. Listen to what it says about these individuals in Isaiah 5 and verse number 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They've got them backwards. They can't distinguish. They, uh, that put darkness for light. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They flip these things around the opposite of what they should be that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But not these men, not these servants that we have in Luke 12. They are clear concerning the light and they make a clear distinction between the two. Ready servants, you want to be ready for the Lord's return? Ready servants are characterized by light and not by darkness. So what does this mean? Look at John chapter 12. This is maybe the most basic truth concerning these individuals that are ready for their master's return. In John chapter 12, and in verse number 46, John 12 and verse number 46, the Lord says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in what? Darkness. Darkness. Jesus is a light and the ones that believe in Him, they have the light. And so maybe the most basic truth, the thing that distinguishes these, these men from those that are not ready for the Master's return is that they believe in the light. That they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are being ready, you are an individual that is ready for the Master's return if it starts right here. In other words, outside of Christ, you can't be ready. It's an impossibility. Only those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, have light. He is a light coming to the world, and the one that believes in him shall not dwell in darkness, shall not abide in darkness. These individuals have faith. You can't do anything that warrants letting your light shine unless you are the light of the world because you are in the light of the world. Jesus said that about himself, right? I am the light of the world. And then he speaks to his church and he says, ye are the light of the world. And I want to, I, we've got to understand that distinction because when we, you know, I said we're going to tie this light to their activity. But when I start talking about their activity, I don't want you to think, oh, okay, well, I keep these lists of things here and then I'm a ready servant. You've got to have light because you're in the light. 
It's got to begin there. It's got to begin with faith in Jesus Christ. And we saw that this morning. That doesn't come from yourself, does it? It is the gift of God. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So you can't do anything that warrants letting your light shine unless you have been made the light of the world because you're in Christ who is the light of the world. And so the daily activity of these individuals is that they believe. In other words, they walk by faith. It's like we were talking about at lunch, brother. We got, we got two natures, right? And then we got the natural sight, and then you got the spiritual sight. And you know what? Sometimes the natural sight's deceiving, and it doesn't go along with the spiritual sight. Which one are you going to go with? Well, if you believe Jesus Christ, you're going to take the spiritual route, right? Every time you're going to walk, not by sight, natural sight, but you're going to walk by faith. And in fact, that's the only way to please this God. Isn't that what Hebrews 11 says? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, right? So this has to be true of these individuals. They are walking by faith because they have light. And as we've already said, this faith is the gift of God. And so their light-bearing ability comes from who? It's got to come from God, right? It's got to come from God. Look at what the Spirit is compared to in Revelation 4. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation 4, and in verse number 5, it says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire. Now, what did I tell you that light's burning over there was? That's a candle or that's a lamp that's burning, right? There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And what were these seven lamps? It's the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. Now, don't get confused about the number there. How many churches were there in chapters 2 and 3? Seven. seven. This is just the manifestation of the Spirit of God in His church. It's just one Spirit. But, this, but the lamps burning represent the Spirit of God. And so it is because of the Spirit, the lamps on the inside of these individuals, that they're able to to have lamps that are burning as they're waiting for the Master's return. Let me just read a few verses to you that reveal God's prior work for these light bearers. Okay, These guys that are ready for the Master's return because their lights are burning. Listen to God's prior work for these light bearers. This is Isaiah 42, 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. That's God's prior work for these light bearers. Listen to Micah 7, 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. God is the source there. Uh, Psalm 18.28 says, For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And then Psalm 112.4 says, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. This is what God does for them. God gives them light. This is the prior work of God for these light bearers so that they're able to to have burning lamps. Now, I know you guys have already thought about this, so let's go ahead and get this passage out of the way. Matthew 25. I know it's already been on your mind as soon as we talked about them having their lamps lit, their lights burning. You can't help but think of Matthew 25, 1, right? The ten virgins. Remember that? Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Here He comes. Are you ready for his, his coming? Go ye out to meet Him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. Why? Because our lamps are gone out. Gone out. Is this, are these individuals ready for the Master's return? No. Because the lamps aren't burning. But the five wise had oil in their lamps. Theirs had not 
gone out. They were not extinguished. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. And we know they tried to get in later. Open, open to us, he says in verse 11, but his response is, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And what's the point to this parable? Same exact point that we have in our previous parable. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. These that were prepared for the bridegroom's return, they had light, right? They had light that had not extinguished. They had continual light. They have the continual supply of the Spirit of God, the oil that is in their lamps, and so their lamps stay ever burning. There are some, according to Hebrews 6, and it's a familiar passage, you can read it some other time, but do you remember that bunch in Hebrews 6 there that it says that they have, it's impossible, you know what, let's just read it, because I want to make sure that, that you, I think I remember it correctly, but I want to make sure that you see that this is how it reads here, because the word's so critical compared to what we're looking at. Verse number 4 of Hebrews 6 says this, For it is impossible for, and impossible for those who were once, and what's the word there? Enlightened. enlightened. They had light. But it was a once enlightenment. Right? It wasn't a continual enlightenment. They were once enlightened. And what else does it say about these individuals? And they have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They had a little taste. They were affected by the Spirit of God for a season. They, uh, 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 you know, and that shouldn't seem strange to us. Think about Balaam in the Old Testament. What that guy prophesied was true. He turns out to be a false prophet that leads, them, leads Israel astray, right? To serve other gods. But when he was prophesying and hired by Balak to curse Israel, what did he do? Every time he opened his mouth, the truth came out. Spirit of God prompted him to speak the truth. And yet he was a false prophet. What about Saul? Saul wanted to kill the guy that God said, this is a man of my own heart. Remember that with King Saul? But do you also remember that there was a time that he was prophesying and they even said, is Saul also among the prophets? Same Spirit of God. Moving on the king that God was going to reject and he was going to take his spirit from him and an evil spirit was sent to him instead. Judas did the same miracles that the rest of the disciples did. He cast out the same devils that the rest of the disciples did. Nobody, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, nobody turned to Judas and said, it must be him, because he's the only one that couldn't do the stuff that everybody else was doing when he sent us out. No one knew. They said, is it me? Some have tasted of the heavenly gift. Some have once been enlightened. But there is no continual effect but those that are ready for the Lord's return ready servants have continual light to shine right that light never expires it never goes out look at 2nd Corinthians chapter number 4 in fact you know what the Lord calls them he calls them children of light right what does it say? Is it 1 John that it says that God is the Father of lights? Right? The one in whom there is no darkness nor shadow of turning. He's the Father of lights. So what you are, children, if you're in Jesus Christ, you are children of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Somebody read that to us already once today, didn't he? That's what the Lord has done for these individuals. This, that's why they're prepared. They have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Light has shined out of darkness. It has shined in their hearts. They are children of light. Look at, a, look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse number 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, 
that that day should overtake you as a thief? What day? The day it says up in verse number 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. One thing we know about the day of the Lord is that it's coming as, as a thief in the night in a time that, we, that man does not expect. And it says they're going to be saying peace and safety and then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. <clears throat> that thought right there is the, the, what tore down any kind of misconceptions that, that I had been raised under about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there was going to be some sort of thousand year reign upon the earth. And, you know, I was going to have some other opportunity be, to be saved after Jesus came back. No, everything that the Scripture teaches me concerning the Lord's return is you better be ready when He comes back because that's it. That's, right. that's good. Yeah. They said peace and safety and sudden destruction came upon them. But you're not like that, brethren. If you are children of light, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So all of that being said, though, that does not come without responsibility, right? And so what does verse 6 say? Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. These individuals have their lamps burning. What does it mean practically for us to have our lamps lit? How are we to be light bearers? Ephesians 5.8 says we need to be clothed in the armor of of light. How are we to be clothed? I think that's right, the right verse. Let me see if I've got that right. Ephesians 5, 8. Nope, that's not it. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's an encouragement there to walk as children of light. <clears throat> I must have had another passage down here, and it wasn't in 1 Thessalonians, was it? Uh... No, I don't know. I don't know where I saw that. You, if you guys find out what I'm talking about there, uh, let me know about that. It talks about putting on, being of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation, verse number 8. But I'm not sure where that thought was about putting on light. But how are we to be ready, practically speaking, how are we to live with our lamps lit? How are we to be light bearers? Romans 13. Romans chapter 13. This might be it. Is this it? It's Romans 13, isn't it? I got a little bit ahead of myself. Thank you, brother. Romans 13, verse number 11. That was that pain medication. That was, that was looking at this during that time. I'm on no narcotics, by the way, this morning, okay? Just ibuprofen. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> I didn't want anything that might impede my judgment, right, while I was up here. So Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time that now, it, and, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There it is. Let us walk honestly. How do, we, how do we manifest that? Walking honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Light bearing is associated with an armor as well, right? Do you guys remember we saw that with girding your loins about you? What was the first description in Ephesians 6 that we saw when it told us to put on the whole armor of God? To put on, gird yourselves with that belt of what? Do you guys remember what it was? Truth. Be girded about with truth, right? So our last point talked about being girded with truth. Who we saw was Jesus Christ. Here, are we, here we are to gird ourselves with light. And guess who that is? That's also Christ, right? Put on the armor of light. Verse 14 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. thereof. And so the way we do that is to walk after the Spirit and not in the flesh. It is to do those things that manifest Christ in us. Look at Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians 3.
Verse number 3 says, You are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. What did our last passage say? Put on Christ, right? Your life, you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so if that's true, if you are in Him, if you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ, then there should be an active work of putting off those things that are contrary to Him and making sure we're putting on the things that are in line with Him. With his character. Look at verse number five. All of the thing, the ways that this is manifested if we are in him. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry. For which things sake the, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Um, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also, here's our, our opposite word, put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. We're putting on off, and then in verse 10, what are we doing? We're putting on, right? And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 12, same thing. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or perfection. And so these are ways that that light bearing takes place, that, 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 that we are clothed in the light, that we are clothed in Jesus Christ, that that is made known as we walk in this present age. Look at Matthew 5. You, you can't deny this being tied to their activity based on the, this text here in Matthew chapter 5. Listen to Matthew 5 and verse number 14. How is it that they are ready for their master's return? They are like these individuals described here in Matthew 5 and verse number 14. And this is where Jesus calls His church the light of the world. Verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Who, who of us has, have you ever lit a candle and just immediately put something over it to, to, to cover it up? No, what's the point in lighting it, right? You're going to save your candle. You're not going to handle it like this. Well, it doesn't make any sense then if we are the light of the world for that light to be hidden, right? How is this manifested? Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. You see why I had to get, I had to set all the groundwork before we got to this? Because some would walk away from this and say, oh, well, that's all I got to do is I got to keep these list of things and my light is so shining. No, you got to have the light on the inside first, right? You got to have the light of the world in you in order for you to be the light of the world. And then they see your good works and what will the result of that be? They will glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's how our lamps are burning. That's why I said this is associated with their activity. Because they're laboring, they're putting off and putting on. They're laboring in the things of the Lord and their good works are being manifested uh, before men. And the result is that God is being glorified. That's our lamps burning when men see those good works and they glorify our Father which is in heaven. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Bless you. I'm glad it was you and not me because that would really hurt right now. They said I don't have any cracked ribs, but man, it feels like it. <laughs> Philippians 2 and verse number 14. Listen to this. Do all... Th well, now, we got to back up, right? Um... Verse number 12, Wherefore, my beloved... Oh, we could back up even more that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We were just talking about that, right? That's what we desire. That's what we're waiting for at the Master's return. We desire that. We want Christ to be glorified as He ought to be. And so, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. That's a description of the children of God. You don't find that in the world. You know, the world's always... We're going to do a good job when the boss is looking, right? 
But well, as soon as they're gone, it's party time. But not the children of God. They have a God consciousness. And Paul said, you guys have obeyed uh, 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 not just while I was there with you, but even much more in my absence. But now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I love that. There's, there's our responsibility to work out your own salvation. But where did all that come from? Verse, uh, you, you always got man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. You can't separate the two. They always go together. For it is God which worketh in you. You're working out that which He has worked in, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And so this will manifest itself outwardly. Right? This activity will be there. The lamps will be burning. And we're going, to, we're going to read about that burning here starting in verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. They're not a complaining group. They're a group that give thanks and glory to God that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's what you are, church. Your light's in a dark world. And as men see your good works, as they see those daily manifestations of the light of God dwelling in you, there are going to be souls that are drawn to that light and they're going to glorify your Father in the day of His appearing. God's going to light other lamps. They may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. A crooked and perverse nation. That's the world we live in. It's never been anything other than that since Adam and Eve fell. We were talking about some of the things that have happened since the kingdom of God was ushered in when Jesus Christ died upon the cross and was raised from the dead. That kingdom, you know, that came without observation but is ruling and reigning right now like we heard about this morning. That kingdom set up in the day uh, 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 where the, uh, of the iron and the clay being mixed together in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And God says, that's a kingdom that was, that stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, that's a kingdom that's going to last forever. Christ is reigning and ruling now, and he, and he has been all these years. But you know what? There's been a lot of darkness and horrible things that have happened in history since that time. Yeah. It's always been a crooked and a perverse nation that these lights have been lit among. Amen. But you know what, children? What a tremendous privilege to be able to glorify God in such a time. You remember over there where it talks about, is it, is it one of Peter's, is it first or second Peter, but where it talks about what glory is it if, you know, because of your wrongdoing, you suffer? Because it's much more glorious and God honoring when you suffer for doing the right thing than because you did so. To shine as lights in this kind of age, that's God honoring. What a privilege to be able to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. What a blessing. And our suffering is so insignificant to what our Lord has suffered for us. Insignificant. <laughs> to hurt a little bit while you preach the Word of God and my Savior hung upon a cross for me. It gave, God gave His life that I might have life. And man, our, our suffering is minuscule compared to that, right? It's minuscule compared to that which God has prepared for us throughout eternity. Didn't Paul write, didn't he say our, 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 our sufferings, you know, they're just minuscule and they're but for a moment, but they work in, in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What a privilege to shine for God in a crooked and a perverse nation. And so that's what the light bearing is associated with. It's all of these characteristics. It's those good works as our light shines before men as Jesus Christ is manifest, manifested day in and day out in our, in our words and in our actions. That's the light that shines before men. Those are the lamps that are constantly burning. But this must come with a warning, and I can't leave you without giving you this. Look at Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. Because 
I could hardly believe this when I read it. Amos chapter 5, and if you're lost trying to find it, I am too. It's, uh, it's Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. So if you can find Daniel and kind of head on towards the end of the Old Testament, you'll run into it. Amos 5 and verse number 18. Listen to this. In Amos 5.18... You know, what is it that we found about these men, these servants that have their loins girded about and their lights are burning? These are men that are waiting for their master's return. They're looking forward to their master's return. Listen to what it says about these individuals in Amos 5 and in verse number 18. Sometimes when you talk about the day of the Lord, sometimes you're thinking about Jesus' return. Right? Other times when you talk about the day of the Lord, it may just be talking about some visitation of God upon a people. It was the day of the Lord when, when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. They should have been ready for the day of the Lord in that hour. And here you've got a people that they, they're looking for the Lord's manifestation. They're looking for Him to reveal Himself, to reveal, make His presence known among them. And look at what it says in verse number 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. They had a desire for that. But it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't a good thing that they were looking forward to that. Verse number 18 says, Woe unto you that desire that. To what end is it for you? You think this is going to be a day of blessing for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. That's the exact opposite of what we find concerning those servants that are ready, right? They're characterized by light. Their lamps are ever burning, but the Lord says, there are going to be those that actually are so deceived that they're looking forward to the coming of that day and it's not going to be a day of light. It's going to be a day of darkness for them. Verse number 19 says, As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, thought he's finally in a place of safety and a serpent bit him there. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Wow! Some will think themselves ready for the Master's coming and they will even be deceived to the point of desiring His return and expecting blessing in that hour. And God said that hour will be a curse rather than a blessing. It'll be a time of darkness rather than a time of light. Why were they in this state? Why, why were things so bad here in Amos? It, it's so bad. Listen to what it says in verse 21. God says, I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. All of these religious things that they were doing, God says, I'm not pleased with any of that stuff. You gather together in your churches and you sing songs of praise, presumably to me, and God says, I hate it, I despise it. Is it possible to be involved in religion? To be that tied up in all of those, that regular routine and you know these feasts and all these things that they were doing? Is it possible that we could do that in that day and be deceived and think that we're ready for the Lord's return and not really ready at all? Yes! That was the case for these souls. They were very religious. Let judgment run down as waters, he says, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? He said, you, you've gone through the motions of things, but you know what? Your hearts have gone after other gods. You've borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chai and your images, the star of your God which ye made to yourselves. And therefore, the day of the Lord for you will be a day of darkness and not a day of light. You know what they should have done? They should have had works. R remember, what, um, remember what John the Baptist said when the religious bunch came out there to him? And he says, what are you doing here? Why did you come? You, know, you think going down in the water here is going to win something for you with God? You think this is going to do you any good? You need to bring forth works that are meet or fit for repentance. 
you need to practice those types of works. You need to practice repentance before God. They should have had a work that evidenced a people that was sorry for their sin and desiring to serve God and not simply a people going through the motions of religion. They should have been a people like God says in verse 15, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. But they had no desire for these things because they had no light on the inside. And that's what, I'm, that's what I want you to understand. That's what, I, that, that's what I want to warn you about concerning this. And the Lord warns us about that very thing in, in Luke 11. Just before our text in Luke chapter 12. And listen to what Jesus says in Luke 11 and in verse number 33 as we, as we draw near the end here. Luke 11 and verse number 33. In Luke 11 and verse 33 it says, No man... When he, hath, when, he, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Now, I want to distinguish between some of these words light and, 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 and candles and things that are in this text. And I want you to understand, when we read over there in our text and it says that they have their lights burning, okay, that Greek word light, that's the, the uh, lights in that text in, in Luke 12 where we were that Greek word lights is the word candle in verse number 33 when it says, No man when he hath lighted a candle. Okay? And, and, and then in verse number 34 when it says, The light of the body is the eye. That's our word lights over there in our text. And then there's one more place as we read on through here in verse 35. It says, Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle, there again is our word lights, doth give thee light. And the reason I wanted to distinguish between that is I want you to understand there's two different Greek words for light in this text here. And I've read you the only three places that have to do with the lights being lit as those servants that were ready for their master's return. Okay? And he tells us here that, if, that the light of the body is the eye, that lamp, that candle. And, and if our eyes are good, right, if we can see, if we have vision, this is, that's how we perceive. I asked Joshua this last night. I said, Joshua, Joshua, how do we perceive light? And he was like, oh, <laughs> like, what do you want me to say? You know, so I was like, do we perceive it with our nose? No. With our ears? No. We perceive it with our eyes, right? And so when our eyes are good, that's when we perceive the light. So your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is evil, then your body is full of darkness. And so it says in verse 35, Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. What did I say in order for you to express light outwardly? What do you got to have inwardly? You got to have the light of the world in you, right? Yes. Who is Christ Himself. If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. That's the way it's got to be if you are to be a people whose lamps are burning and you are prepared for the Master's return. There are two Greek words. Every other Greek word here that has to do with light, it is either the exact same Greek word or it comes from the Greek word, which is the word that the Lord uses when He speaks of Himself and He says, I am the light of the world. Remember it says John in the beginning of John 1, like around verse 8 or verse 9, it says that John the Baptist was not that light, but he came to testify of that light. And it says concerning the light that he came to testify of, that was the true light. Right? Which is Jesus Christ. Well, if there's a true light, which is Christ, if God's got to qualify that, that light and, says, and say that there is a true light, then there must also be a false light, right? There must be a false manifestation of light. And that's exactly what we find, isn't it? Look at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. What is Satan characterized by here in the ministers of Satan? In 2 Corinthians 11 and in verse number 
13, when he's speaking of these that are taking advantage of the Corinthians, that are not preaching uh, the true Christ. They, they're, if he that cometh, in verse number 4, preacheth another Jesus. They're, pre they're not preaching the true Jesus. They're not revealing the true light. They're, preaching, they're presenting to you a false light. They're preaching a false Jesus to you, another Jesus. He says in verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And he said, says, Don't be surprised about this. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. light. There is the true light, but there are also those that are deceived. And so it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And so even in our parable, as we talk about that light shining, we saw there in Amos that there are some looking forward to the coming of the day of the Lord, and they think their candle's lit, but it's not with the true light. There is that which manifests itself as light, but is in fact the false light. And so we recognize and we have to, even though we're familiar with this, we have to refresh ourselves in it and realize the seriousness of this matter. Because in Matthew 7 and in verse number 22, the Lord says that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name, and in Thy name have cast out devils, and in Thy name done many wonderful works. What do we associate the shining of the light with? That they may see Your good works and glorify Your Father which is in heaven, right? Lord, in that day, they're looking for the day of the Lord, and they're saying, yeah, we can't wait for Him to come back. And in that day, we'll say, we've done many wonderful works in Your name. But what will He say? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew You. Depart from Me. You know all those works that you were so excited about? <coughs> Let me tell you what you were doing. You were working iniquity. And so it comes with that warning. And I, I felt like I wouldn't be faithful to your souls if I didn't share that aspect of it with you. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. And be sure that it's that light that God has worked in here that manifests the light outwardly. And Lord willing, next time when we look at the qualifications, so we've looked at their outward appearance and them being girded about, and we've looked at their activity and their lamps burning, the next time we're going to see what's going on inwardly. But if the light is there on the inside, then the true light will be manifested on the outside. And so we'll close with Daniel. How about that? We started with Daniel in the first service. And we'll close with it this afternoon because I want you to see the eternal state of those in Daniel 12 that are the light, the, the light bearers, the ones that have their lamps burning, their lights burning as they await the Master's return. Look at Daniel 12 at the Lord's eternal description of these individuals. Let's read in verse number 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and such as never was... Uh, was I'm sorry, I skipped a place. Uh, standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, and every one that shall be found written in the book. What does that sound like? It sounds like the end of the age, right? At the Lord's return. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars. How long? Forever, Forever and ever. Right? Their lamps are burning when the Master returns. And guess how long they are going to be shining for His glory? Forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord.